Great. So welcome everyone. Um, David Myers, the Executive Director of the Conservation Finance Alliance. We are uh, thrilled today to have uh, another in our sessions on the CFA Incubator, um, where over the course of uh, the past year, we've been working with uh, 15 different organizations and companies um, working on innovative finance mechanisms. And um, we're thrilled that, that one of the, uh, the five organizations that, that received a, a grant is uh, uh, Blue Finance. And um, we have a really interesting presentation today from Angie Bratwaith, who will um, present on um, some of their thoughts and, and, and approaches to how to finance uh, coral restoration efforts. Um, focusing on the Caribbean, but of course this has implications everywhere. And um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Angie. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, well, thank you very much for having me. I'm really, um, I was very happy to be chosen for, for the incubation grant and I think I've used it quite wisely. Um, I have a little presentation. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, Give it a go. Okay, can you see the screen? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, um, if any of you read the blurb um, that went along with the presentation, you would have seen that I was definitely looking at payment for ecosystem services when I when I started um, this incubation. I was convinced that payment for ecosystem services was a good way to pay for coral reef conservation because corals protect coasts from, from the shoreline. So, um, sorry, protect coasts from high energy waves. Um, they reduce coastal erosion. So I thought it was, you know, pretty much a match made in heaven, um, but I was wrong. So you can see now that um, what I've changed the topic to is investment in nature-based solutions for beach protection. So I'm Angelique Brathwaite. I'm a marine biologist. I am not an economist by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but the great thing about this incubator project was that it assisted me in working with economists and er working with engineers um, in order to come up with a solution that, that I think makes everyone happy. Um, before I get into the solution itself, I wanted to speak a little bit about Blue Finance. Um, we just have some of the faces up here because we are a small NGO and we work on providing solutions um, sustainable financing solutions for marine conservation in the form of MPAs. Um, and in order for an MPA, the, the solution that we use most of the time involves blended finance, so impact investment debt, as well as grants. So for a, a system like this to work, it means that your management has to be effective. It means that your ecosystem has, has to be healthy. And in that, you know, we're looking at ways that this healthy ecosystem can pay for itself. Um, so we do look at ways in which those guys who are benefiting from the services of coral reefs um, are able to contribute to the health of the reefs that provide the services for them. So let's uh, get a little bit into, into what we found or what we looked at. Well, what the issue is. Um, coral reefs are deteriorating and this is causing increased severity of beach erosion. It's really important to know that, you know, not all coral reefs protect all beaches and you have to really identify the ones that do, um, but some of them do. And this is in addition to um, public health, uh, human health, um, this also uh, decreases aesthetic appeal for visitors. Um, but, you know, this has been happening for a long time and we've used, I'm from Barbados, I should have said that before, and a lot of this work is focused in Barbados. Um, we've been using bright waters for ages and we do it very well and the bright waters work extremely well. However, they are expensive, as are some nature-based solutions. Um, they do require maintenance, but I think most importantly, they don't improve overall reef health. And this is something that we want to do. This, you know, We don't just wanna put something there to break waves, but we want to be able to improve reef health as we do it. Um, sometimes breakwaters also cause negative impacts um, on the natural reef, mainly from the, the work that's done to get them in place. And there are a bunch of opportunities here. Um, we know that beat stability can be improved by increasing coral cover. Um, and currently the idea, the, the thought is that um, once you have 10% of um, 
reef building species, not just the hard corals, but the, 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 the ones that really contribute to the infrastructure like the acroporates, um, you should have you know, adequate, uh, I, I would say, rugosity to attenuate weight and improve your beach stability. So that is a target we're, we're aiming for. Um, coral reef restoration techniques have improved a lot. And I mean, I'm one of those that in the beginning, I was like, no, 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 why are we going with reef restoration? We need to deal with the, you know, unsustainable fishing and water quality first. Um, and now I'm like, we need to look at all of them together. And the reef restoration techniques have improved a lot. And many of them are focusing on actually using those species that are more resilient to things like um, coral bleaching and acidification and so on, and focusing on those and getting those to grow. Um, the other opportunity is that hoteliers really need beaches. Um, most hotels have a beautiful white sandy beach in front of their property. That brings people in. They have been a lot of willingness to pay studies that have shown you know, how much these beaches actually um, help hotels attract guests. Um, and the reef restoration can actually provide additional activities for guests. And there's so many guests now who are eco-conscious and they want to, you know, not just come and lie on the beach, but they also want to, you know, be sure that they're contributing to some sort of environmental conservation project. So there are a bunch of opportunities here. Um, so our project really, as I mentioned before, is divided into three parts not really divided, they kind of swam with each other. So the first is kind of ecology. Um, again, not all corals, not all reefs protect all beaches. If we want the beneficiaries, the hoteliers to pay for it, uh, we need to be sure that that reef actually protects that beach. So that, that, that was the first part of it, um, determining this for two sites in Barbados. And also, you know, if we're gonna put a solution on this reef, where on the reef should we put it, right? Should we put it on the back reef? Should we put it on the reef crest? Where exactly should, should we put that? So we're moving now into the engineering. Um, we worked with the engineers who were horrified at some of the assumptions we were making as ecologists. And ecologists were horrified at some of the things the engineers were saying also. Um, but the engineers modeled and were able to show uh, what part of the reef do we need to put the structure in order to attenuate waves. And we're, we're looking at um, wave attenuation, not really in the present, but we're looking in terms of sea level rise or expected sea level rise um, and increasing intensity of storms, especially. Okay? Um, so I think it's important to say here that we also targeted stable beaches. We did not look at beaches that were actively undergoing erosion because in that case, any hotelier, if I was a hotelier, I would go for my gray solution. I wouldn't even think about a nature-based solution because my beach is disappearing, right? And we're, we're in panic mode at that stage. Um, so we got the ecological, we got the engineering, and then we're looking at the financing. As I mentioned before, we wanted those who are benefiting primarily, the hoteliers, to make some um, contribute to the payment um, of the solution and towards the health of the reef that is providing the service for them. Um, so we got a, you know, we, we developed it and we produced a very nice pitch. This was just uh, the first page and we ran it past uh, a few hoteliers. Um, so our solution was to transform your hotel and environs into a blue green space. And the idea was that we'd improve um, beach stability through coral restoration, um, as well as your guest experience. Um, as much as, you know, hoteliers care about beach stability, it usually doesn't become too stark unless they've actually had a hurricane or a storm, in which case there's, there's a bit of a mad scramble. So we had to have something else. And the great thing is, is that the solutions that, you know, the artificial reef solutions that we come up with are also quite attractive and will also attract fish and will also attract tourists. So we wrapped it up into one bundle. Um, so it's two components, the reef restoration component and engaging activities for your guests, which are around the whole coral reef restoration project. Um, we gave them two options, an expensive one, a not so expensive one. Um, this is a not so expensive one, which is coral gardens. Um, growing coral fragments from sustainable sources and outplanted onto the reefs over a period of time. This is natural, 100% um, local, it's the lowest cost. But of course, the, the impacts of this are not immediately evident. So again, remember, we chose stable beaches so people are not in panic mode. 
I think the important thing here is that depending on, on what method you use, it will probably take about 10 years before corals reach the sort of size where they can effectively attenuate waves. So this is, you know, this is, this is a, a long-term um, ongoing solution. And then the premier um, option too is with eco reefs. Now these eco reefs will also have corals transplanted onto them, right? Because when we were looking at, at, at the solution, there are two things that we need in order for the solution to be effective. And the first thing is it needs to attenuate waves, high energy waves, right? We need to reduce the energy that's coming in, but it also needs to be able to maintain itself. Otherwise, it's just gonna be like that, that gray, fully gray bright water solution um, that is, is currently being used. Corals need to be able to grow and cover these structures um, so that they can maintain themselves, they can accrete and grow, keep pace with, with sea level rise if need be. So the idea was to print these uh, 3D structures. And I have to say that we met these guys because they're also part of the CEFA um, incubation lab. Um, so we, we spoke to them um, and they do a number of different designs. I mean, some like the top one, you know, the fish can go in and hide like the, the one on, on the bottom is more adapted to the actual shape of the reef. So the idea is to intersperse these within the natural reef and then have um, corals growing on, on and around them. Um, these are great because they improve your chances for coral survival. They're elevated off the seafloor, improve habitat for fish and other critters like lobsters and so on. And there's immediate attractiveness and immediate wave attenuation if, if needed. So this is a, um, a short-term solution. So wrapped up in all of that would be um, long-term coral monitoring and maintenance, uh, underwater trails, the participation in coral rehabilitation, and as well as um, uh, virtual reality in the hotel. So even those people who don't get wet can, can you know, have a seat and can see the work that is being done. So of course, the idea here is to just market the space as a, as a totally blue-green space. Um, the costs. So we're, we're looking out for about a 30 meter beach. So of course we did this, um, you know, for a specific site, but it can be, it, it can be varied. We were really interested more in the process and how we did it. Um, and what we came up with is a turnkey solution, which is averaging 220,000 um, US. So remember we have a, a low option, a high option, which is averaged this right in the center. The idea is that um, there are upfront costs that you need to set up nursery, et cetera. That's around 100,000 uh, K, 100,000 K, 100, K, sorry. Um, and this project will adapt to a larger area or smaller areas I mentioned before, okay? The idea is also that, that our, our NGO will partner with existing car coral nurseries. That's my 10 minutes, I'm gonna be very quick. Um, so Blue Finance will finance upfront capital costs. That's at us. The idea is that the hotel does not pay anything upfront. Our NGO will provide that. But then we enter into an engagement with the hoteliers for a minimum of eight years where they will pay on average um, 30,000 US per year. And this, for this, they will get the full design of the reef, the nurseries and installation, long-term monitoring and maintenance guest activities. And yeah, this is a pretty um, picture we ended with on the pitch. So, you know, we, we did actually present it to a couple of hoteliers in Barbados, but of course COVID-19 hit and they liked it, but they were like, hell no. <laughs> Everybody's thinking about keeping their head above water at this point in time. Nobody is putting out an additional dollar where it is not needed. Um, and they, they agreed with me in that a solution like this is great post COVID because it does mean that it will give them a marketing edge and also they don't have to pull out all their money immediately. So, you know, in spite of all of that great talk, no one was biting in Barbados at this at the moment. And uh, just last week, I have to say, I spoke to a, a guy called Andrew Ross, who was working out of Jamaica. And I mean, he surprised me because a hotel actually approached him for a solution for coastal protection. So at this stage, I'm gonna hand over to Andrew just to talk to you for five minutes. Um, so you can see that this is not just some pipe dream, it's actually something that can work and is working. And unfortunately, we only found him last week, but we do plan to work with him. So I'm gonna hand over to you now, Andrew. Goodness gracious. Uh, hello, can, Andrew, you can hear me okay? 
Yeah, I can hear you fine. I'm trying to stop right. sharing my screen. Yeah, here we go. Okay. Okay. So do I, I'm going to share a screen as well then. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I guess first and foremost, my name is Andrew Ross. Um, I did my PhD in coral starting in about 2004 or five. Um, so ultimately was amongst the early adopters. Uh, come 2008, halfway through grad school, um, a hotelier happened to see what we were doing uh, in terms of sort of disposing of our research materials, which was really building up a nice local reef and said, could we do that for a hotel? I thought this was a great idea. So we put, a put, it, what, uh, we put together a proposal uh, they didn't call back. I think it was too expensive. Um, it may have been too expensive. Uh, either way, though, it sort of started a conversation that has basically turned us into what is off and on the only contractor that we've been able to find, um, specifically looking at propagative coral culture for the enhancement of coral reefs um, under um, landscaping ethos, ultimately. So, um, uh, 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 snorkeling, beautification, things like that. And it's been apparent from early on that the primary value proposition for what we do in terms of actually generating the money that it actually takes to do this or the value, excuse me, to actually do this is to uh, enter into a, a collaborative or a competitive position with um, traditional coastal engineering uh, because the beach is where the value proposition is for a hotelier, not necessarily in the snorkeling. I'm trying to figure out where my backlighting is. There you go. <laughs> that didn't really work either. Um, all right, so let's share some screen and have a quick chit chat. So I've ear I've aired this towards uh, Angie's presentation um, in order to. Oh, where are we? Oh, that's not right. Ooh. All right, uh, I've aired this towards Angie's presentation in order to try and not uh, step on her toes is the wrong word. Um, in order to not uh, reinvent the wheel, so to speak. How do I do this? Play. Do I do that? Let's just start there. How about it? And th at the bottom, there's a screen share uh, no, button. I, I see that button. I'm to just share. trying to figure out how to get it to. <laughs> then, then, then you have to hit share again one, one more time. Once you've selected this, which screen you're going to share. Right. Let me see if I can do this. Oh, oh, here we go. Yes, great. Just share. Ah, no, that wasn't right either. Share screen. Hit it again. Oh, OK. We That's select fine. which one? Share. Ah, there you oh, go. Great. Can you see it? Yep. Looking Magical. Good. Magical. Apologies for, yeah. <laughs> Luddite me. All right. So, wave attenuation, sand and seagrass, sand, seagrass, and beach as coastal defense, which I've misspelled. Apologies. Uh, for living coral reef. Basically, the, the joke is that we're trying to rekindle the prehistoric historic norm. So, uh, we'll get into that in a second. So, Let's look at some history. Prior to 1980, this is what a Caribbean reef looked like. You had these, uh, it was dominated by Elkhorn and Staghorn corals, depending on how deep you were. And you could see these big, robust Elkhorn corals. They would grow to the surface and they would stay there through the changes in sea level rise and so on and so forth over the last, you know, 25 million years, he says. Um, it, and, 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 but it's not a solid piece of structure. It is a tangle of branches uh, that would not necessarily block a wave, but it would attenuate the energy by increasing the rugosity of the sea, sea bottom, greatly reducing and rapidly because it's branches, greatly reducing the, the depth of water and keeping it reduced. And through processes that were, uh, the term was coined uh, by Antonius Felagracus, um, lattice turbulence just an incredibly complicated process of how to move a wave through a branch structure. Um, so the general idea that he came up with was this, that you have these lattice structures of interlocking branches and they create turbulences through. So you get a pulsed flow with the wave and it basically takes that powerful breakage, breaking, erosive, pulsing force of the wave. Excuse my dogs having a drama that pulsing force of the wave, and it turns it into a nice even flow on the downstream side. So any, any sediments that are collected within that, that are moving in that wave, get deposited within and then get moved to the downstream side, i.e. from reef to beach or to seagrass initially and then to beach. So ch changes in kinetic energy and the heat sound, shear forces, a lot of stuff that I don't fully understand. I'm an ecologist, it's what I do. But ultimately the wave is dissipated 
but the water volume is not. So you don't actually lose on the downstream side bathing quality. So the photograph that Angie showed you before of the big uh, solid stone reef revetment structure, revetment is the wrong term, breakwater structure, what you'll often find on the downstream side of that is a lagoonal condition where the water quality is reduced, where you get uh, a lot of turbidity, you get a lot of uh, maybe unwelcome fauna, a jellyfish and so on, stingrays. Um, and just, it's not as nice a place as you want it to be. You want a nice exposed beach with lots of flow. And this is, you know, the reef provides that through these sort of flow processes. So this, this is a side view of the photograph that I showed above. Um, and you can see, you can see eight meters through that reef to the light on the other side. These are big, beautiful corals that are filling space, but the water can move through, everything moves through. And you can see just happy fish in that space too. Well, assuming there were fish. Uh, so here's an interesting photograph. In 1972, this site, a place called in Unity Hall and just outside of Montego Bay, was one of Jacques Cousteau's favorite places. It's on one of his TV shows. Um, and then uh, Phil Dustin came back in 2001. That's what it looked like, you know, post the dieback through the early 1980s of the specific species that were the dominant species. So in the top photograph, you see lots and lots of branching structure, lots and lots of habitat. The thing to be reminded there is that every one of those branching corals is bright, bright gold. Some of the other ones have other colors and so on. There's lots going on, but it's bright, bright gold. And then the bottom picture is dominated by turf algaes, stones, macroalgae, mounding corals that don't have that iridescent color. They also don't have anywhere near that structure, surface area, uh, wave attenuation capacity, rugosity, all of these other ecosystem services that are provided by these branching corals specifically that were the dominant species. 50% of what you saw on the bottom, shallower than 20 meters, was one of these branching, high branch golden species of coral um, prior to 1980. And in starting in about 1980, one, two, three, at least in Jamaica, they started to die back. And that process is largely continuing through the Caribbean, although a lot of places, Jamaica, Jamaica included, have basically found the rock bottom and started moving back up again. So keeping in mind this and this, this is what a little bit of reef, lovely reefscape is now, that would have been one of those, is now in front of a hotel in Jamaica, or just down the road here, which hopefully will be a client soon. Um, yeah, is, that's what it is. So you can see a wave coming through doesn't feel anything, just makes it right to the shore without a whole lot of breaking until it gets into and starts causing mischief. Um, uh, erosion, changes of the beach structure. So you go from sand to cobble um, and all those sorts of things. So that's the sort of thing we're looking at. And from a longer term, this is again, not my slide. Um, from a longer term point of view, this is what you get. So in Jamaica, in Negril specifically is where we're talking about here. The top photograph shows what you had in 1970. You had an enormous amount of these branching corals right up at the reef crest. And in the four, and then the four reef, it basically vacuumed all the energy out of the waves. So they deposited sand on the downstream you got seagrasses, and then you got beaches, and then you got dunes, and then you got flora that held the dunes in place. You put some hotels in, you dynamite the reef, you then get a, uh, you get a disease event, which is what happened in the Caribbean in the early 80s, and these corals die. And the difference between what we would call a reef and arguably the Pacific condition versus the Caribbean condition is that when the corals die and you have a really solid reef structure, not much changes for a long time because you're talking about rock that had a veneer of live tissue on top. When you're talking about branches, you're talking about, um, oh, you're, ta you, you're talking about an attenuation structure. You're talking about basically, I mean, the, the analogy would be a giant, would be a big oak tree. So when that oak tree is alive, you have very little breeze in the downstream side. The tree dies, you still have very little breeze. Two big storms come along and an infestation of, of termites, the tree falls down. And you go from, in our case, uh, you go from centimeters deep to meters deep within a couple of storms. And that greatly changes the wave structure as it reaches the shore in the very immediate term. And then as it erodes the sands and so on and so forth and continues to break those corals down, it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, there you go. So that's, the, that's where I ran out of pictures ultimately. 
Um, so we then have, we talk about the alternatives, uh, value, so that's basically what we're talking about there then. There you go, let me go back. What we're talking about there is what I would describe as the primary value proposition to uh, coral restoration, looking at the ecosystem service that is of arguably from a hotel's point of view of greatest value, beach preservation. If you don't have a beach, if your coastal hotel without a beach, you're really not doing very well. So your first step is coastal protection. And that's where the value is going to come to actually get to scale in doing tens of thousands of corals under what, what I, we're calling a silvicultural model, as opposed to the horticultural model, which will do dozens of corals. So the photographs that Angie was showing you, talking about 10 years of, of work to get to a point, they're beautiful. They're very patchy. They're the size of my kitchen. Um, if you're, once you get up into hectares, you have to have, you get into a hybrid system in the short term in order to make sure the client's happy in the short and in the long term to really build it up. Um, and then the solid silvicultural model will, will actually get you to scales and amounts that will actually start attenuating wave energy. Um, okay, so where are we here? Okay, so alternatives to that. So wave energy is one part of it. Is one part of the total value proposition for why a hotel would restore their coral reef or restore coral to their existing reef and therein improve their reef generally. Um, the number two, and obviously, and, and the most obvious, is snorkeling and recreation. Um, it provides green marketing, green branding, novel, marketable asset for the hotel, uh, activities for the hotel, not all exposures, oddly enough, because you can get now yourself, you can get yourself into National Geographic, which gives you, for example, National Geographic, David Attenborough, gets you a completely new exposure of guests to say, oh, I like this hotel, let's go there. Um, novel guest experiences with actually working with coral, uh, different types of snorkeling, more interactive and more educational, edutainment type snorkeling, as opposed to just going out and looking at pretty fishes, you now get guided snorkeling and you get integration of community and you get other elements that are coming along at the same time. And then beyond that, you get avenues within the gift shop for ROI and more direct you know, incomes. You get to sell people uh, non-toxic sunscreens, for example, for three times the money, all of that sort of thing that my cynical mind immediately goes into. Um, it's a weirdly hard sell. Uh, it's a weirdly hard sell because it's considered an environmental program. That I learned early on, as I say, I started this in probably 2006 before I got formal in 2008. I learned early on that the second the word environment comes into any client conversation, it automatically knocks an order of magnitude, a zero, a not, from the amount of money that the client is interested in paying. So if, the, if in the first phone call, the, C, the, the GM says, oh, let me, talk, let me put you in touch with our environmental manager, the conversation's finished. It has to stay, and for me, it has to stay with the engineering department, it has to stay with the marketing department and with the managers. It has to stay up the top. The second sort of trickles down into environment, then they're not willing to pay what it costs me to do it. There's no break even for me, um, which is a strange conversation to have. The next and obviously equally important from a, from a, uh, from a community and from a larger based point of view and a slightly different approach because you're now dealing with slightly deeper water, you're dealing with uh, more complicated structures of ecosystem is looking at fisheries enhancement. So that, these are tend to be community projects. So my first big project was with the Gold, Golden Eye Hotel and it was quickly subsumed by, as a snorkeling garden, um, and it was quickly subsumed by what the, the, the Orca Besa Bay Fish Sanctuary, which was a weird offshoot to our original idea of the snorkeling garden. Um, and it went from concentrating on high color elkhorn coral, right up in the shallow where the guests could see it, to branching more branching species a little bit deeper down. And that was great. I had no problem with that. It all was really, really fun. Um, so what we're looking at is improved ecosystem productivity, improved catch weights, species diversity, uh, improved per organism size. Oops, spelling is. Oh no, that's, yeah, okay. Um, all of these types of things that work in conjunction with an MPA. So an MPA is achieving, but what we're doing from the coral point of view is improving the general characteristics of the reefscape through improving the habitat quality, uh, oddly, oddly enough, the smell of the water to attract recruitment, uh, theoretically the sound of the water to in, attract re recruitment 
and a number of other things that are all happening in junction in that case, and in most cases, with an MPA. Uh, for the resort partner specifically, you're now being able to talk about community engagement, relationships with the community, which in some cases means reduced theft, um, reduced, reduced uh, 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 hawkers on the, beach, on the beach side, because you're working with the community, reduced uh, spear fishermen in the swimming area, move them offshore a little bit. Uh, these types of things, uh, changes to the type of, uh, of tours and so on that you can offer because you have a better relationship with the community. Some hotels already have that, that they can work for. Others are a bit more segregated, a little bit more boxed in, particularly the all-inclusive properties, that this sort of thing is actually quite positive for them. Um, corporate responsibility, it's all very marketable as well. Um, and then ultimately, the thing that we don't really talk about is aesthetics. In the Caribbean, we lost these bright gold, gold corals, at least in the Jamaica, in the 80s. This is eons ago. So the active reefscape, uh, so we had the opportunity to basically adapt the color of the reefscape. So if I'm standing on the shore, particularly the second store balcony, I'm looking down into the sea. Today, I look at the color green, gray, brown, primarily the colors of macroalgae, stones, uh, mounding coral. There's not a dominant color to it. There's no real pop. Um, the next element to that would be, and then, yes, so there you go. Pre-1980, which arguably is where we're trying to take ourselves back to, for the Caribbean, that natural color was an iridescent gold. So let me take you back to this one for a second. You can't see it, it's a little deep, but imagine that it pops, it glows. So anybody who worked at Discovery Bay prior to 1980, for example, this is what they remember. They remember going out and the water just looked more colorful. And they can't, well, the scientists can but normal people who snorkeled there, they won't say that it was uh, more lively or more anything. They will just say that it was more colorful. Um, and that's what it was. You're really looking at the bright, 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 vibrant colors of these golden dominant corals. And you're not necessarily within it, as we get into the artistic elements and the landscaping conversation, you're not necessarily limited to that gold. In the Caribbean, that's the primary. Those are the ones that we're missing from an ecosystem function standpoint. Um, but there are lots of greens and yellows and reds and other colors that if one put the effort in and that was the goal, you could really dominate that space with those other colors and really get that pop if that's what the client was looking for. And not necessarily as an ecosystem negative, as, an ecos as what would still be defined as an ecosystem positive um, because you're still improving the ecosystem functions, the, the reefscape, the, the, the aroma for recruitment, all of these types of things are gonna come arguably, regardless of the species you actually concentrate on. Now, my last sort of two and a half slides are based on horticultural versus silvicultural ethos. Um, currently, we're, as a field, we're, most are concentrating on what we describe as a horticultural ethos. So when you look at the Coral Restoration Foundation website, for example, you see these grand, or anywhere on Instagram, you see these beautiful nurseries. You don't see a lot of planted coral because the nursery is arguably what you're selling because you're not selling the ecosystem service, you're selling the coral itself. It's a hope question, it's a hope sale, uh, which is great for the NGO world, but as a contractor, that's not really where I go. I'm trying to sell an endpoint. Um, so that within the horticulture, it's your garden. It's the idea of coral gardening is based on that. So you have relatively small amounts of very large corals when you go to your planting and they're primarily in the nursery. So you're putting a lot of effort into keeping them alive in both the nursery and on ground. And your investment in the nursery is long and it's involved in order to get these large corals, which makes it problematic when you start talking about scaling, particularly if you're having a nursery or a system per resort, because you can't take big ones from here and bring them there. You can't have a central location where it's gonna be nice and efficient. You have to have per, 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 which means you have to do your visits per, which is time consuming. Um, and that has to do with gene flow and things like that. You don't necessarily want to take corals from here and move them there. And how we define here and there is another conversation. Yeah. Um, and then we get into the idea of a silvicultural ethos, which basically puts very, very little time. It's the difference between a uh, nursery, you, you go down to the garden center and you buy a tree versus you go to the, uh, the forestry lot and you buy seeds. That's the difference. So enormous amounts of very small propagules, very small corals, 
you ask them to grow on the reef where you really want them. You're not putting a lot of effort into the, into the immediacy of the, um, you're not putting a lot of effort into growth in the nursery. <laughs> Andrew, it's, it's very hard. It's very hard to hear you no, right no, now. I'm gonna go deal with this. And I'll You're close this to the end, though. so just maybe you should. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So um, Andrew's going to finish up, but um, do continue to write questions into the chat box so that we can ask okay. um, Angie and, and Andrew afterwards. Okay. Good. Okay. Andrew, go ahead. Back to you. No, no, that's it. That's it. Oh, basically, okay. my name is. Uh, back to what we started with. My name is Andrew Ross. I am a contractor uh, specializing in, the, in coral uh, cultural en enhancements, uh, largely targeted to tourism uh, within general schemes, themes of landscaping. Um, yeah, there you go. Great, just, uh, just brother, real quickly though, because you were just talking about the, 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 the methods of um, you know, the civil culture, just, just maybe just finish up that thought in terms of um, you know, getting the, you know, what, what is it that you're getting out there like seeding the, the coral reef? These are micro fragments, these are, what, what are you starting with? It would be a version of a micro fragment. I, I mean, I work, I do both, as I said, and we've, I found the horticultural general ethos is useful, particularly when you're getting started to generate your initial material. Uh, but getting it planted was always sort of the um, bugbear, for lack of a better way to describe it. Um, the existing methods are relatively inefficient. There's not a lot off the shelf that you can necessarily buy. So you end up having a, you, you end up having a design it, create it, invent it to a certain extent, and then build it all, which has been a really creative and fun road, also an inefficient and expensive road. So, um, oh, I didn't put those pictures on. Yeah, so the idea is that within the, within the horticultural, I, I won't get into it necessarily, but you, you, have, you tend to have these larger nursery installations that grow larger corals. And then, so when it, within the idea of, uh, of invention and planting, if that's your initial coral, I brought, uh, I brought uh, props. Uh, if that's your initial coral and it's hanging, growing in the nursery like this, something like that, uh, getting that, well, there would be more of it coming off this side. Getting that onto the seafloor is a bit of a drama. It takes some concrete it, or it takes some time or some tying or some element that takes more time than you really want to put in if you're trying to do 500 corals in a day. So what we did is we invented basically a glorified washer, whoops, a glorified washer, which you attach to the coral in the nursery. So it's now growing like that. Your coral then, I don't know if you can see that, your coral then overgrows the washer and incorporates it into the skeleton. I then come along afterwards with my little clippy clips. I nip it from the nursery as that, what we jokingly call a planting unit, because we're still working on the terminology. And with a good old fashioned masonry screw, mm, you just pop that through there and you literally with a hand screwdriver screw that into the reef um so that's the first of many that that's within the so that's within the horticultural method i would call that a horticultural coral um because it's big within the civil cultural method we would start with the same coral in the nursery we, we would then rather than have two corals from that we would get 50. so each one is that big and we put it into a slightly different version of the same sort of washer and we put it into a slightly uh, into an adapted version of a similar um an adapted much larger scale version of a similar nursery um and we do tens of thousands of them at a time and they have a total in so whereas this one might have an in nursery period of anywhere from sort of six to 18 months depending on what you're trying to achieve um the silvicultural nubbin we, we have a turnaround of a hundred days. So we put them into the nursery specifically and only in as much time as it takes for them to overgrow or to um, heal and to begin to overgrow that washer device. And then we plant them down to the seafloor very, very quickly. The idea is that the coral then spends, all, it spends its energy rather than producing new polyps and coming up, it spends its energy attaching itself to the seafloor uh, before it starts coming up. So now we're talking about, that's an aesthetic impact after minutes, uh, minutes on the bottom, albeit you've already invested 18 months in that coral. Uh, whereas the silvicultural, um, it is 18 months before it does that, before it's there and before you get that aesthetic impact. The difference is rather than one, there's already 50 of them on the bottom, right. which means Great. that aesthetic impact really explodes. 
Okay, thanks, thanks so much, Andrew. Um, really a, a fascinating topic uh, overall. I think it'd be great to open up to questions um, to, uh, to, to Angie um, and yourself um, from the audience. We had one question that came in um, earlier um, from Marina. Um, you're welcome to unmute yourself. And Andrew, if you can switch off your screen share and people welcome to unmute themselves yourselves I mean you know undo your camera if you'd like and ask the question directly I know Angie you've already responded to a certain extent but it's always nice to have uh, everyone um, who, to, to be able to hear the question and, and the response It'd be great thank you David this is uh, Irina I just just to repeat my question um, I was wondering in terms of trying to build a business case for private players um, whether uh, there has been some work done in trying to quantify in financial terms uh, the benefits that the um, coral reef restorations will have for hotels, potentially for fishing industry, and also whether there has been any outreach to insurance companies, because clearly they benefit um, from uh, storm uh, attenuation and um, decreased uh, beach erosion. I was just wondering if there are actually, you know, speaking of appealing to private players, if there were these financial calculations that could show how much they get back in return for their investment on coral restoration. Thank you. And I, I had responded in the chat because quite a lot of that work has been done in Barbados um, with Schumann's work at CERMI. So we didn't, we didn't redo that. We already have quite a lot of information on that. Insurance is something that we've been dancing around for a while. Um, and really we've just started looking at it at a bit more in depth. I saw Simon is, is, is here, Simon Young, and we started speaking to him about it. So that's something that we're now actually um, starting to explore. Uh, just, to, just to add really quickly, uh, uh, Mike Beck's team used to be at TNC, now he's at uh, UC, I don't remember. Santa Cruz, I think. Uh, they are still working on the insurance element and quantifying uh, coastal protection, but primarily related to flooding as opposed to wave damage, albeit they're working into wave damage now. Um, that's the insurance element, and that's something we're sort of pushing fairly, try, trying to find, because that's a really nice hook. Um, a lot of hotels in the Caribbean now, particularly the chains, they're either having a lot of trouble getting insurance full stop, which is the hook we're trying to sink, or um, it's untenably expensive. So most of them are, are self-insuring. So they just put money into a kitty every year. Um, and that's uh, trying to tap into that again is an interesting series of conversations, but it's ongoing. And there is a zeitgeist that is slowly building in, certainly in coral generally and in, in tourism and hotels. Um, in terms of the value proposition part, I, I need to see Angie's, Angie's work out of Barbados. This is really good. I have two hotels currently who would give you access to their books if you think you could come and tease the value out of it. Uh, the yeah, reality I, I, is I can't, but I know the economists who can, for sure. There we go. There we go. There we go. I, I'll sit them down with their, with the, uh, with their uh, uh, accounts people, and if they can tease out the value, that would be really fun. Yeah, but I just have to reiterate um, that we met, we kind of met last week. I kind of knew Andrew for a long time, but in terms of this specific project, we, we started really talking about it last week. And it's really interesting because from my perspective, it's been mainly theoretical and speaking to people about what we can and can't do. And then we found Andrew who's actually activating, who's actually you know on the ground doing it. So we're gonna change quite a few more things in our model now after, and we're definitely gonna be working with Andrew, but we'll be changing quite a few things now that we're working with Andrew and he has this amazing method of, of growing corals, especially at the, the rates that, that he's, he's managed to find that he can do. Great. And so it looks we have a few, few more questions. Um, one from Gonzalo. Gonzalo, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay. Hi. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone, for the interesting uh, talk. So, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, interested, especially on the um, artificial structure side of, the, of this approach. And I was wondering if, if you already have tested any type of prototype. Uh, sometimes uh, we, we know a lot of uh, developers doing this or trying to do this type of approach, but we always find uh, some um, difficulties trying to balance the, the right stability 
especially on, 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 on uh, high wave energy sites. And as you uh, said also, well enough, uh, or the right complexity, rugosity for, for, uh, to support coral rehabilitation. So I, I was wondering if, if you have some type of prototype and I saw an image on the presentation about an Atrix uh, 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 prototype. I, I was also wondering if you work with them or if you have any, I don't know, any other type of prototype uh, uh, ready or, or, or at least you have already tested something. Right, thanks. So there's a yes and there's a no here. So Natrix, we haven't worked with them. We found them through the same CFA incubator and we were like, wow, this is exactly the sort of thing that we're looking for. So remember if I tell you that most of what I've said so far is very much so theoretical. So Natrix have tested their models and they've tested their models not on our Caribbean reefs. They've tested their models mainly in North America. Um, so we would have to test them on our reefs, but in terms of stability, their structures are stable. And that's something that our, our engineers will say yay or nay on. Um, the other thing is, is they're made of concrete. Concrete is one of the best structures you could find for coral recruitment, but we're not even just relying on coral recruitment. I mean, the plan is not to, and corals will recruit to concrete naturally. They will um, once, once there's larvae in the water but we don't wanna wait for that. We're actually going to plant corals or whatever you wanna call it, but plant corals actually onto these structures. So the, the rugosity of the actual structure itself is not so important, even though it's quite fine, you know, being concrete, um, but we're actually planning to put coral structures onto these, both um, Andrew's method in terms of um, actually, you know, put in corals on that have grown in nurseries and also doing the microfrag, which, which Andrew also does. So, so to answer your question, sorry, sure, they went off. Stability, Natrix has guaranteed us that they are stable in their conditions. We are yet to test them in Caribbean conditions on the reef crest in those high energy environments. Um, and the second one, we complexity and rugosity, yeah, but no issue with that at all. Just, uh, Gonzalo, just to extend that a little bit. Um, years ago, we did we uh, we had an opportunity to to try lattice turbulence with a steel device. It was a series of sort of uh, um, oh, I can't think of it. <laughs> half half tube. There's a term, but I can't think of it. Uh, made out of uh, BRC, uh, so basically just various metal meshes, steel meshes, um, in front of a Sandals Hotel in the Grill. And it, this was in collaboration with um, Liana Samuels, who was finishing her PhD at uh, Stanford at the time. She was just sort of advising us in the background. Um, and it worked, but it what didn't work as well as we'd like it to. We had very interesting accumulations of sand on the downstream and also on the upstream, because it was really, it got in the way of the waves just enough to cause a little bit of mischief, but not enough to really make the client happy. So that was the end of that. Um, the other element, and it was stable. It's been stable through, you know, that was 10 years ago. It's been stable through two major ship strikes and a couple of hurricanes. So back reef and grill, it didn't get really pounded. Um, and again, it was, uh, it was, it, we just anchored it really well, ultimately. The, uh, and in terms of being able to set structure into very shallow water and highly exposed conditions, my suggestion would be to just go live, go with live coral. Um, a certain amount of artificial reef structure is a good idea if you have the stability to get it going or if you can directly screw it or cement it to the sea bottom. But if you start with very small live corals, just by virtue of very little, uh, very streamlined ultimately because they're teeny, then they spend a lot, they spend their first couple of months securing themselves at the bottom and then they come up. So if the bottom is reasonably clean, which is an ecosystem question to a certain extent, you just put some effort into making sure the ecosystem is ticking and then you put the corals in. The corals will fill that space ultimately. They, they will secure themselves and they will adapt in terms of the basics of the morphology to the conditions. So if it's a place that gets hammered, they get thick and they get very heavy and they don't really invest in coming up until they're really ready for it. Um, so you get some flexibility. You also get breakage and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. but that's part of the natural process. So if I can uh, go back. So the, the idea we had with the artificial reefs um, with two, two pronged. One is to give the corals a little bit of elevation off the bottom, which is where all the sedimentation is coming from. So it gives them a little a better chance really um, to survive. 
And the second one is if, as what has happened in quite a few countries, you know, you have a full a mortality event and the coral, grow, the coral nurseries are not as good as yours, Andrew, and there's like 80% mortality or there's a disease or there's a hurricane, you've lost everything and you have to start again from scratch. Whereas with the artificial structure, at least you do have something there that can still assist with wave attenuation as you, you know, as you wait for your corals to grow again. And the second thing, a difference between practice and, and reality. So I spoke to so many people about, for example, the Mars stars, which were those interlocking metal structures. And all I heard was that they deteriorated within, within five years. Um, so I, I eliminated, when we started, we had about 20 artificial reef structures that we were looking at and we eliminated based on one of the things was actually stability. And we eliminated that metal structure because the practitioners said it deteriorated. Mark. So it's really interesting to hear that you have had one that has been in for about 10 years and is still going strong. So, you know, I, everything that I'm hearing is still, is still, you know, helping to shift and change the, the solutions that we've come up with. Mars, Mars, Angie, Mars, and, and, uh, Andrew, I just, want to, I just want to take the conversation a little uh, away from uh, some of the technical details and more into the finance and insurance uh, pieces oh, no. here. Sorry, I know. Um, <laughs> no, but we had, a, we had a, a couple of questions around insurance and actually, um, so uh, Natalia had, a, a, she was going to mention something about um, some work that they did in uh, Anguilla. And Simon uh, Young can, can say a few words about uh, insurance and, and how that might be related to this. I think that's quite, would be quite important. Um, Natalia, are you able to um, share that with us? Hi, uh, yeah, sure. Um, hi, sorry, my name's uh, Natalia Karate. I work at a consultancy actually based in London called FTEC. Um, we've actually done quite a few natural capital accounts for the Caribbean overseas territories, specifically for Turks and Caicos, Anguilla and Montserrat. And we're doing some current work for Cayman, the Cayman Islands and BVI as well. Um, Anguilla, the last account is actually quite interesting on this insurance topic because we actually interviewed quite a few insurers on the island after Hurricane Irma and Maria, um, mainly because we were looking at how to show the um, value that the coral reefs did provide in some form of protection, even though obviously the hurricane was quite intense and horrific. Um, so I just wanted to flag that report really. It's publicly accessible um, through, the, through JNCC, the UK Joint Nature Conservation Committee. Um, and it's kind of work that we're continuing to do. And we've had the same conversations about kind of how to use natural capital assessments and accounting to build like business cases and things like that for private sectors. So one of the valuation methods we did use was um, avoided uh, loss of business days, um, as well as attributing it to national accounts through like taxes uh, to kind of get the public sector involved as well in funding these types of initiatives. Um, just wanted to flag that in, in case anyone was interested. <laughs> Yes, it sounds really interesting, Natalia. If you if you don't mind sharing a link to, uh, to that in the um, in the chat, that would be fantastic to that study. Yes, of great. course. <laughs> Excellent. And Simon, over to you. Uh, thanks, Dave, um, and uh, thanks, Angie, and uh, and Andrew. Nice to nice to see you again. Um, uh, and Natalia, that was really interesting. I'll I'll touch base with you separately. I, I wanted to make a couple of points. One is that. Um, converting the protection value of reefs and other ecosystems, uh, mangroves uh, notably, it, um, capturing that value in on the insurance side is is really difficult. Um, it, it's uh, there are a variety of reasons for that, um, but effectively the uh, that protective value isn't really priced into insurance um, at the individual kind of property level. Um, it, it, it gets to be a little bit more interesting if you have a big development or a big hotel complex. Um, but the problem with the hotel complexes is, is, is oftentimes they're part of global program, insurance programs. And so, again, that kind of particular risk analysis for a particular hotel on the north coast of Jamaica um, doesn't, doesn't play a significant role in the overall pricing of the insurance. So, uh, you know, the, the, the protective value of the reef is very hard to extract. Um, I, I would flag that Conservation International have a project called RISCO, which is ongoing in the Philippines. Um, and that's kind of, I would say, advancing this thinking quite probably in the most practical way. Um, 
and then uh, TMC have done quite a bit of work on this, um, and we're, we're we've been involved in that. Um, so there's there's some interesting developments, and there's you know, and I think the kind of uh, the kind of stuff that that um, that Natalia you were just mentioning is is really important to um, you know to 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 quantify that value, um, and if it needs to be a public you know, a public investment in maintaining that protective value, then I think we need to be honest about that um, and um, and kind of put the put reef and, and ecosystem conservation, preservation and rejuvenation into the uh, into the same bucket as maintaining roads and power lines and and other gray infrastructure. Uh, because uh, you know that's it, it's generating economic value, and I think if if we expect the private sector to pick that up it, um, themselves as our solution, then that's that's not going to work. Um, I think the private sector can play a role, uh, but it's um, it, it, I, I think on that side the protective value piece we, we're going to have to capture through getting governments to recognise that it should be part of their uh, their public works um, budgets, for example. Um, the, the second point I'd, I'd make is that we are doing practical insurance applications for coral reefs, and that's mainly to um, to activate rapid response to reef damage. Um, and you know, the basis to that is that it's really, really cost effective to um, to get uh, direct action on the reef very, very quickly after a um, after a, a, a hurricane, a hurricane or or a, other storm event. And that's not just to uh, to kind of pr maintain the protective value, but also the other economic values that are being generated, and particularly to fisheries and tourism. And um, we did some very crude cost benefit analysis, and it's um, it, even making very conservative assumptions. Um, it's a really the the benefit to cost ratio is very very high for that rapid action, and um, and, and we've demonstrated how parametric insurance can be used to um, to fund that action and therefore to promote the organization that's needed to make sure that that action happens quickly. Um, and we're expanding that in in the on the Mesoamerican Reef right now in a, in a, in a significant project. We're also looking at it in Hawaii with TNC. Uh, and we also have a project proposal in for expanding that into the Eastern Caribbean as well. So hopefully we'll have some good news on that. Um, in the next month or so, um, and I'd certainly be connecting into those of you who are working in the in the Eastern Caribbean, and probably Andrew, you as well in Jamaica, um, to see what we can do with that. Thanks, Dave. Well, uh, thank you so much, Simon, and and tell you that um, uh, just uh, for those of you who want, just that link is is provided in the in the chat box. Um, Angie um, and Andrew, thank you so much for um, for your presentation. And um, if uh, anyone needs to to reach out to either of them, please uh, let us know um, and uh, um, put you in touch. And uh, thanks so much for for your participation. And we do have we actually have a webinar coming up um, with Natrix um, next uh, next week, I believe on. Uh, Wednesday, if I'm not mistaken, at 11 a.m. Please register at the CFA website. And also a quick shout out to ICRI who have a recent publication on the different methods around coral reef restoration. So with that, uh, thank you all for, for joining and um, wish you a uh, best uh, evening and rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Angie, everybody. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks. <laughs> See you. See you.